Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church to our online service as we uh, continue to adjust and make some changes. We're thankful that we can still broadcast to those of you that aren't quite yet comfortable being back here in person with us. Know that we love you, we pray for you, and we do look forward to seeing you soon. And we're glad that you can be a part of our service, even though you're scattered instead of being gathered here with us in person. We are continuing our uh, For Our Good series as we look at the life of Joseph. And this morning, we're going to be covering chapters 42 and 43. So I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles. Make sure you uh, go ahead and get into Genesis 42 and 43. And we're going to end the message today by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you want to bookmark that section too, so it'll be a little easier to turn there when we get to that point of the service. Before we jump into the sermon, I would like to pray for us and ask God just to speak to us and, and help us to know what it is that he wants us to know this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that it has in our lives, the power that it has to uh, lead us to salvation, the power that it has to sustain us, to sanctify us, Father. But uh, we thank you for the power that it has to help us uh, understand maybe why we go through some of the things we go through, uh, whether it's difficult times or maybe even just when times are going well. We understand that you're working always, and we thank you so much for that. So we do ask that you use your your word in our hearts this morning, that you help us to remove any distractions, help us to focus completely on you, and that you speak directly to us and that we are obedient to what it is you put on our heart. We love you and we thank you. And we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 42. As we continue the story of Joseph, um, it's interesting to see all that has unfolded so far. And I just want to give you a couple of reminders of what we have seen in Joseph and who he has been. His story begins as he was the favored son. He was the favorite son because he was the first son of uh, Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. He was the hated brother. Uh, Jacob was obvious in his favoritism by giving Joseph this colorful robe, this colorful tunic, and that upset his brothers. And so he was the favorite son, the hated brother. They decided to sell him into slavery but through that, God's favor was still on him, so he was now the favored slave. He excelled in Potiphar's house. He was given a responsibility. He was given privileges. But along that came a false accusation. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. From there, he was thrown into prison where he again was a favored prisoner. He was given special privileges. He was over all the prisoners um, that were in the prison with him. He was a dream interpreter. Not only did he have a dream himself at the beginning of this story, but the cupbearer and the baker had dreams that he was able to interpret. And because of that, um, both of those dreams came true. The cupbearer was elevated back to his position, whereas the baker was killed. Um, from there, he was the forgotten dream interpreter. He pled with the cupbearer, please don't forget me, remember me. But it was two years before the cupbearer remembered that Joseph was able to interpret dreams. And the reason he remembered that is because Pharaoh had two dreams himself that nobody was able to interpret. Both of the dreams had the same meaning that there would be seven years of a good harvest immediately followed by seven years of famine. And so he was remembered and he was elevated. And at this point in his story, he is in second command. He is second in charge of all of Egypt. And so everything that takes place from this story out, we see that Joseph is in control of everything except for Pharaoh. And so he has gone from this spoiled little brother who was favored by his father and hated by his brothers, thrown into slavery, into a pit, then sold into slavery, and then uh, falsely accused, placed in prison, and forgotten. He was in prison for about 13 years. And then he was remembered. And all along, God was able to remind Joseph to remain faithful, 
to remind him of his presence. And he's done, he's doing the same thing with us today. Even as we wait, even as we're nervous, even as we're scared, we can be reminded that God is with us and that his presence is always there. Genesis chapter 42, uh, the first verse reminds us that Jacob would never win any father of the year award. Look at what it says. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? Jacob just assumes that his sons know what they need to do. And he comes in and he says, why do you, why are you staring at each other? Go to Egypt, go and get the food. If you remember, uh, at the very beginning of his story, Jacob, knowing about the dreams that Joseph had, knowing that his brothers hated him, Jacob still sent Joseph to go and check on his brothers, to bring back a report from his brothers, which meant that uh, his brothers viewed it as not only was he favored, but he was a uh, tattletale, so to speak. He was coming in and giving a report on them. God had Joseph where he wants Joseph, doing what he wants Joseph to do. God wanted Joseph to be in Egypt. God wanted Joseph to be in the position that he's in. And if you remember last week, I asked a question about why would God allow Joseph to go through all he went through? Why didn't Joseph just, I mean, God just placed Joseph in Egypt instead of having him sold into slavery, falsely accused, forgotten in prison for so many years? And I mentioned to you that it was God preparing Joseph for what he was going to do through him. And it wasn't just to get Joseph to Egypt to save the nation and even his family. But even more so, I believe that God allowed Joseph to go through what he went through so that he would be in a place where he could not only forgive his brothers, but seek reconciliation. You see, at this point in the story, the, the focus shifts uh, primarily from Joseph to his brothers. We see God bringing these brothers back and we see this theme of reconciliation that starts to unfold in Genesis 42 and 43. Reconciliation is a theme that we see throughout the Bible and is often accompanied with forgiveness, but the two are not the same. I want to share a quote that I read earlier this week by a pastor named Steve Cornell. He said, Jesus clearly warned that God will not forgive our sins if we do not forgive those who sin against us. He references Matthew 6 and Mark 11. It's not that we earn God's forgiveness by forgiving. Instead, God expects forgiven people to forgive. He references Matthew 18. Yet forgiveness is very different from reconciliation. It's possible to forgive someone without offering immediate reconciliation. It's possible for forgiveness to occur, to occur in the context of one's relationship with God apart from contact with her offender. But reconciliation is focused on restoring broken relationships. And where trust is deeply broken, restoration is a process, sometimes a lengthy one. Differing from forgiveness, reconciliation is often conditioned on the attitude and actions of the offender. While its aim is restoration of a broken relationship, those who commit significant and repeated offenses must be willing to recognize that reconciliation is a process. If they're genuinely repentant, they will recognize and accept that the harm they've caused takes time to heal. Reconciliation, we see it because of the brokenness that occurred in Genesis 3. And we see that theme unfold throughout Scripture. Joseph seeks to reconcile with his brothers, but he needs to make sure that they are repentant of what they did to him. See, it's a two-way street. Reconciliation must be both sides coming together to reconcile the brokenness or the differences. And so Joseph does two things in Genesis 42 and 43 that take place on these two visits that his brothers have in Egypt. The first visit we see is in Genesis 42. And what we see here is that Joseph tests his brothers. First thing we see is that Joseph tests his brothers. Look with me in Genesis 42. And again, I'm not going to read the whole chapter of 42 or 43, but I want to read verses 7 through 17. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers 
and spoke harshly to them. Remember, Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain, and Joseph was in charge of that process. So when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan to buy food, they replied. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the weakness of the land. No, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food, they said. We are all sons of one man. We are honest. Your servants are not spies. No, he said to him, You have come to see the weakness of the land. But they replied in verse 13, We, your servants, were twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and the one is no longer living. Then Joseph said to them, I have spoken. You are spies. Verse 15, This is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. Send one from among you to get your brother. The rest of you will be imprisoned so that your words can be tested to see if they are true. If they are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. So Joseph imprisoned them together for three days. We see the roles have kind of reversed now. They sold Joseph into slavery, which led him to prison. And now Joseph has put his brothers into prison. And this is not out of revenge or hatred, but Joseph is testing to see if they are truly repentant of what happened. And so we see reading further in verses 21 through 26. And they said to each other, obviously we are being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but he would not listen, but we would not listen. That is why this trouble has come to us. But Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to harm the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must account for his blood. Verse 23, they did not realize that Joseph understood them since there was an interpreter between them. Verse 24, he turned away from them and wept. And when he turned back and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and had him bound before their eyes. Joseph then gave orders to fill their containers with grain, return each man's silver to his sack and give them provisions for their journey. This order was carried out. They loaded the grain on their donkeys and left there. Joseph is, uh, as you can imagine, is overwhelmed with emotion. Once he hears of their sorrow, of their guilt, of their repentance, he weeps. He is unable to to control his emotions, and he has to turn away from them. And so what he does is he decides instead of keeping all of them, he keeps one. He keeps Simeon, and he sends the rest of them back with grain to uh, their father. But what he does is he puts all their money back in their sacks of grain. And so Joseph is testing his brothers, and what he found out during the test is they regret what they did. They are sorrowful because of what they did to him. And so in visit two, we find in Genesis chapter 43. And what we see here is that Joseph doesn't test, but he treats his brothers. The brothers have returned home. They share with their father what happened, that they were supposed to go back and take Benjamin. Jacob refuses to let them go. He's their youngest son, his youngest son, their youngest brother. He says, I've already lost one brother, one son. I can't afford to lose another son. And so he, but the uh, famine had become so severe that he had no other choice. And so Jacob decided to let them go and take Benjamin. And he packed his sons with some of the finest gifts of the land, loaded them up with Benjamin and sent them back to Egypt. Look at Genesis 43, verses 15 through 17. The men took this gift, double the amount of silver and Benjamin. They immediately went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his steward, Take the men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare it, for they will eat with me at noon. The man did as Joseph had said and brought them to Joseph's house. You notice that it doesn't say that when Joseph saw that they brought all of his money back. 
It doesn't say that um, when Joseph saw all the fine gifts that they brought, that he told the servant to go and prepare a meal for them. No, it says, when Joseph saw Benjamin, he said to his steward, take the men to my house, slaughter an animal and prepare it for they will eat with me at noon. The brothers were terrified when they got word that here, follow us. We're taking you to Joseph's house. I'm sure they expected the worst, but what they got was the complete opposite. Look at verses 20 through 23. They said, my Lord, speaking to a steward, we really did come down here the first time only to buy food. When we came to the place where we lodged for the night and opened our bags of grain, each one's silver was at the top of the bag. It was the full amount of our silver, and we have brought it back with us. We have brought additional silver with us to buy food. We don't know who put the silver in the bags. And the steward said, may you be well. Don't be afraid. Your God and the God of your father must have put the treasure in your bags. I received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Joseph's brother from uh, his mother, remember Jacob had two wives and their servants. And so he had sons, 12 total, from four different women. Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife. That's the one he wanted in the beginning. Uh, but he was tricked and fooled and married Leah. Jacob's wife, Rachel, had two sons. The first was Joseph, which is why Joseph was the favorite son. But the second was Benjamin. And that's why Benjamin stayed back, because he didn't want to lose his other son. And so these men expressed their fear to Joseph's steward. And he says, don't worry. I know. I got your silver. It must have been your God who did this. And let's fast forward to verses 29 through 34. They are, um, have been summoned to Joseph's house. It says, when he looked up and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he asked, is this the youngest brother that you told me about? Then he said, may God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out because he was overcome with emotion for his brother. And he was about to weep. When he went into an inner room, he wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. Regaining his composure, he said, serve the meal. They served him by himself, his brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who were eating with them by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, since that is detestable to them. They were seated before him in order by age, from the firstborn to the youngest. The men looked at each other in astonishment. Portions were served to them from Joseph's table, and Benjamin's portion was five times larger than any of theirs. They drank and became drunk with Joseph. Obviously, we're going to stay away from that last part. We're not promoting uh, drunkenness. But what we do see is that not only were they treated to a nice meal, not only were they able to eat in Joseph's house, but they were fed the same food that Joseph was eating. They were sat in order of their age. Benjamin, obviously having uh, a piece of Joseph's heart because he understands uh, being the youngest and having the same mother. Benjamin was treated better than the others, was given more than they were given. But they also got to eat the food from Joseph's table. Now, this is a perfect picture of reconciliation because once the restoration has begun, God invites us to his table. When we are repentant of our sins, when we confess our wrongdoing, God welcomes us in. He doesn't wait for us to get our act together. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves. He doesn't wait for us to get to a point where we're no longer sinning. He welcomes us in and he feeds us with the best of the best because that's who he is. He is a loving God. And we see that Joseph is doing the same with his brothers. Reconciliation is unfolding here in this story. And the reconciliation is leading to restoration. Now, next week, we will see in the next few chapters how all of this unfolds in the reunion that we have. But I want to close out this morning by just offering a few words on reconciliation. First and foremost, reconciliation is a matter of the heart. See, our hearts have to be in a position where we not, can on, not only can forgive, but we can seek to restore what has been broken. 
Reconciliation must include both sides. The offended must be willing to forgive and move forward to the restoration process, but the offender must be willing to repent of their wrongdoing and willingly accept the forgiveness and move forward to restore the broken relationship together. See, it's a matter of the heart because if we're holding on to bitterness, if we're holding on to unforgiveness, if we're not willing to move forward, then how can we accept the forgiveness that God gives us? See, in order to forgive others, we must first have been forgiven by God. And so we have to receive his forgiveness. And as a result of that, we willingly offer forgiveness to others because we were once in a position where we didn't deserve the forgiveness, but God freely gave us that through his son. So first and foremost, it's a matter of the heart. But secondly, and connected to the first, reconciliation is also a matter of obedience. It's a matter of obedience. And we see both of these unfolding in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip over there. Hopefully you bookmarked it. But 2 Corinthians 5, I want to close out this morning by reading verses 16 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective. Yet now we no longer know him in this way. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything, verse 18, is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And we see a picture of the gospel. Verse 21, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I love verse 17. Because what this means is that if we are in Christ, it says that we are a new creation. And what that means is that brokenness has been fixed. And so reconciliation is really uh, pursuing that brokenness to be healed, to be fixed, to be restored. And that can only happen through Christ Jesus. You see, apart from Jesus, we cannot be restored. We will remain broken. And because of that, the following verse says that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. Verse 20 says that we are his ambassador, that God is making his appeal through us so that we plead for others to be reconciled to God through Jesus. We can't fix anybody. We can't fix our own brokenness, much less try to fix somebody else's. But for those of us who have been restored, who have been reconciled, What we are to now do is to help others see that that is what Jesus desires of them. So we simply point people to Jesus. We are his ambassador. We represent Jesus. And we plead with people to be reconciled to God. And reconciliation can only happen through Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection. We are broken people. And that brokenness can only be fixed through God's love put on display for us through Jesus. So have you accepted God's gift of salvation and God's gift of restoration? We ask him to forgive us of our sins. We accept his forgiveness. We place our trust in him. And now we are a part of the same ministry. We plead with others. We seek Uh, Seek out others who are broken. As you see the Hoosier one sign behind me. Salvation is reconciliation at its core. And so who's your one? Do you know somebody that is broken? 
Do you know someone that is trying to find things in this world that can only be found in Jesus? You see, we represent Jesus, and I want to encourage you, as Joseph has done with his brothers, to seek reconciliation. Next week, we will see the joy that comes from that, the restoration that comes from that. But it's my hope and prayer that first and foremost, you've accepted the gift of restoration of salvation through Jesus, that you have asked God for forgiveness of your sins, and that now we are in this ministry of reconciliation together. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the love that you put on display through him. We thank you for the cross that he took our sins, our brokenness upon himself to bring us healing and restoration. Father, for those of us who have accepted that, who are new creations, help us to live out the ministry of reconciliation that you've given us. But Father, maybe if there's someone watching that is not, Father, may you break their hearts of the sin in their lives and show them that you are the only way to healing, that you are the only way to restoration. We thank you for making all that possible. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. If I can do anything for you, if we as a church can do anything for you, help walk through this with you, we want to do that. We love you. We're praying for you, and we look forward to seeing how God's going to use this in our lives. Hope to see you soon. Take care.